Welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, I just wanted to clarify something real quick for the baptisms tonight. If, if you're doing a remembering your baptism, you could still sign up and come and do that. It's just if you were going to be a first time baptism, we had a training, so you missed the training. But if you want to remember your baptism, you didn't sign up, go for it. Just make sure you sign up so that we know how long we have to stand in the water. That'd be great. <laughs> I'm really excited for it. I can't wait. I hope that you'll uh, be a part of that. I think it's important to have these benchmark spiritual moments that, where we can say for ourselves, hey, look, whatever my life has been yesterday or the last few years or decades, I'm deciding right now it's going to be different tomorrow. And, and I think we all need moments like that. So this is a way for us to give you, hopefully, a moment where the Lord, you can feel the Lord's presence in a powerful way. All right, so we're in this series. This is the second installment. If you missed the first, you can always go uh, watch or listen online. And uh, it's called Streams in the Wasteland. Three incredible promises of God's provision. And the whole idea is whenever you're going through the wilderness, whenever you're going through a tough time in your life, and some of you, you're not, and things are great, and I just want to encourage you, throw a party. <laughs> Enjoy it as long as you can. Don't be like me, where I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Things are great until they're not, you know. Don't do that. Have fun. Be thankful. Give thanks to God. But maybe the next time you're going through a wilderness, you're going through a tough time in your life, or maybe some of you, you're like, nah, I'm firmly in the wilderness, thank you. These three promises will change everything. Not that it will magically lift you out of all wilderness situations in your life, but rather it changes how you experience it. You could find the presence of God in some of the most meaningful, life-changing ways, even in the midst of the pain and the heartache. And these promises help get us there. Okay, so what we say last week, we did a little Bear grills, right? So... Uh, Bear Grylls, man versus wild, he gets dropped in these situations where he's in the wilderness, he shows us how to survive. I said, it's kind of like that. Sometimes we're just dropped in the wilderness. Life happens to us. There are things that happen that aren't our fault. And sometimes these things happen to us and we are dropped in the wilderness. We've got to figure out what to do. We're disoriented, not sure what to do. What, what are some examples? Hey, you know, I lost my job, you know, the company was downsizing. Or maybe as a child, you know, listen, I was, I was verbally abused when I was growing up, or I have some baggage from a relationship in my life. Whatever that is, things happen to us and can have a big impact on us and leave us in a wilderness. But much of the time, at least for me, I seem to just walk right into it. Sometimes we find ourselves in a wilderness of our own making based on the decisions that we're making. We make choices that either unintentionally or intentionally go against what God wants for us, and it lands us in the wilderness. Now, back to Bear Grylls, which, by the way, someone told me after service that he wrote a devotional, so I bought it. It's really cool. He's apparently a really strong man of faith. I did not know that. So thank you uh, for sharing that, and you could all go buy his devotional. He's not paying me. You, he should. You listening, Bear? A little royalty. Um, but anyway, he, he always talks about in how to survive, you got to find the river. Find the river. That's where you're going to find life. Obviously, you're going to drink from it. You're going to find food around it. And then follow it because the river eventually is going to lead to civilization. And we were saying that there's some sort of spiritual equivalent here. When you're in the wilderness, when you don't know what to do, when you're scared, when you're disoriented, find the river. What do I mean? Find the impossible presence of God in the midst of the pain, because he's there. God makes a promise in Isaiah 43. He says this, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. In other words, I'm making life. I'm making the river flow through places it shouldn't flow. And sometimes we think we can create the river on our own, right? Well, I'm lost, I'm hurting, I'm disoriented. Let me make some magic, figure out all this. And we can't. It's the Lord's supernatural provision. 
So we talked last week about incredible promise number one. Although it seems impossible, you can trust that God will provide. Every time. God shows up every time. Now the next impossible promise is probably the most important one, but it's number two in the order that we're talking about it. And I want to share it through a story. So um, again, many of you know, left Southern California at 15 years old. We moved to the Poconos in Pennsylvania. It was like Los Angeles to East Stroudsburg. It was a little different. <laughs> little different. It was like going back in a time machine. Uh, not in a good way. Anyway, so we're in the Poconos. Here I was a California kid, and I'm experiencing things like, it's under 30 degrees. <laughs> this is both awesome and awful. Another thing that I didn't know is that the first day of hunting season we had off of school, <laughs> that was a thing. Any Pennsylvania folks here? Like, you're like, yeah, that's what we do, yeah. First day of hunting season, deer hunting season. This wasn't that long ago. Okay, it was a long time ago. Not, anyway, first day of hunting season. So then uh, one day during hunting season, my dad comes in excitedly. Jason, you got to see what our neighbor got across the street. That's it. That's all the context I have. Great. So I'm like, wow, he's really excited about this. I go over there, and he's got a deer, dead deer, hanging in his garage by the feet, and he's starting to skin it to process it. And I'm like, silence of the lambs. Like, I was, this is, I was horrified. I was absolutely horrified. What is this? Is this legal? What are you doing? I just, I didn't know. I, I had not experienced that before. And then it's like, like a car crash. Like, and then I'm watching and I'm horrified and I'm like watching them do it. And I don't know, man. It was just so foreign to me. And when I think about it, um, I really don't want to know how the sausage is made. I don't want to know how you do any of that. Give me the cellophane wrapped thing of meat. And we're good. In fact, if it's too bloody, I'm going to pass and go to the cleaner one because that's how I like it. But this actually, uh, the reason I tell that story is because I think it's a, it's a window into a topic that we don't talk about a lot. And if you're new with us, this is going to be a little more of a technical sermon. Um, so they're not all quite like this. This is a little bit of teaching because of the idea of sacrifice. One of the things I struggled with when I was pretty new to understanding God and what Jesus did on the cross was the whole idea of like animal sacrifice and just sacrifice in general. I'm like, what is that? Is God just excessively violent? Is God a God of violence? Is this like, what does this really mean? I, I don't understand. It seems so barbaric. What the heck does this have to do with me following Jesus now? Why that? As a, as a main understanding of the Christian faith. Why something so violent? And the pathway that, you know, where I was asking these questions led me to a really profound place for me. And I want to share that journey a little bit with you because I think this is important to wrestle to the ground a little bit. So I believe in, in, in a theological topic called uh, divine accommodation. Divine accommodation. This just simply means that God speaks to human beings through their own culture because it's a language they understand at that time. In other words, I can't go back in history and explain to younger me everything from the digital age. I would not understand what the heck you're talking about. I'm like, yeah, you know, we have the Tandy 2000 in our house, and we have one computer, and everybody shares it. With the dot matrix printer. Oh, yeah, that's how I'm bringing some of you back. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't understand it. Things had pro progressed too much. I, I couldn't explain to me back then. I, I wouldn't have been able to receive it. So if we think about this in terms of God explaining truth to human, humanity, he's done it through culture every step of the way. Let me, let me show you an example. Let's go to the map. Um... So let's say in the neighborhood of 1450 to 1410 B.C., quite a long time ago, the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness. This is when 
sacrifice is talked about by God for them to understand. More on that in a minute. So God uses sacrifice to explain something true about our relationship with him. We'll come back to sacrifice. But just as an example, you know, then you get to the Roman Empire around 27 B.C. to 400 A.D. What was all the rage during that time was Greek philosophy. So you'll see in the New Testament a lot of Greek philosophical ideas embedded in it. Why? Because God's using culture to say something true about God in a language they understand at that time. So if you read the Gospel of John, for example, um, it starts out, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with us, right? The Word made flesh. That word, the Greek word for word, is logos, which was a Greek philosophical idea. The logos, the, the first of all creation, right? And so what they were doing was, the New Testament writers were saying, hey, Greek philosophers, this is what you've been missing the whole time. The logos is Jesus Christ. He is the Word of God made flesh. And so people at that time would be like, oh, yeah, because what was God doing? Taking culture and leveraging it so that they could understand. It continued. I mean, just think about like the high Middle Ages and scholasticism God used to help bring people back to uh, some of the first writings and the teachings of um, the ancient sort of patriarchs of the early Christian faith onto the Protestant Reformation and the Renaissance. And these are all areas where like arts and the printing press and innovation all sort of began to speak to our relationship with God in one way or another. On to the beginning of the information age, which uh, many pinned back at 1970. The smartphone age, about 2010, right? God is using culture to explain truth. Now, he doesn't just take culture and be like, oh yeah, it's just like that. He takes culture and says, I'm like that, but I'm different than that. Now, think about if God didn't do this. So if God explained, you know, the Protestant Reformation to the ancient Israelites wandering in the desert, the ideas that were coming up, they simply could not have comprehended it. Their culture was not there yet. It would be like uh, Stephen Hawking teaching astrophysics to preschoolers, right? It's like, or, oh, okay, if that doesn't work for you, then Arnold Schwarzenegger as a kindergarten teacher. Whatever it is, whatever works. But I do believe that in this divine accommodation that God speaks to us in our culture at that given moment so that we can understand. And what more ultimate divine accommodation is that he became one of us to speak in our language that we could understand. It's kind of like, uh, some of you have heard me say this before, it's like the chicken coop. Chicken coop's on fire. Farmer's trying to save the chickens. He opens the door to the coop. Chickens just stay there. Things burning down. He's trying to urge the chickens to get out. They're not listening. Starts picking up chickens and throwing them out. They come running back in. He thinks to himself, if I could speak chicken, or better yet, if I could become a chicken and then they could listen to me, I could communicate and lead them to their safety. Otherwise, they're going to die. As goofy as that is, can also speak to the fact that he became one of us so that we can understand to follow him to salvation, divine accommodation. If you think about the idea of sacrifice and at the time of the people of Israel and then what Jesus was going to do for us, think, you know, how does God explain the gravity of sin, that it's a matter of life and death, the power of forgiveness, living in a relationship with God? How does God do that? He does it through sacrifice. So let's dig in. Let's follow this rabbit trail a little bit of sacrifice. So for the ancient Jewish, Jewish people, I always have to remind myself, slaughtering animals and the concept of life-giving blood wasn't excessive violence. It was everyday provision. It was survival. In an ancient subsistence agrarian society, killing animals was a way of living. I, I often think about, I think it's beautiful the way a lot of our Native American cultures view their relationship with, with the land, with the animals, that they kill, but it's almost spiritual in their gratitude that they've been provided for, that they're going to survive because this animal sacrificed for them. I feel like maybe that's a little bit of a window into ancient Jewish culture and the idea of sacrifice. Now, blood was considered then to have the power of life. 
Right? That's how we survive. And so here's, here's the culture piece. During that time, it wasn't just the Israelites. Many cultures did animal sacrifices. In fact, they also did human sacrifices, which is absolutely horrific. In order to appease their gods, they had to sacrifice. So you see what our God did was take the idea of sacrifice. Oh yeah, I want you to sacrifice, but the sacrifice is for you. It's so you can live. It's not so I am so appeased. It's so you are freed. And I'm not going to require human sacrifice. I think that's what that whole scene was where the angel stopped from the killing of Isaac. If you remember that story, I think it's because God's saying, I am not asking for human sacrifice. I'm different than those other gods. And the sacrifices are so that you can be forgiven. And so what's God doing? God's leveraging culture to share something true about himself. So this is, this is what they believed at the time, right? And this is what we believe now. God says the penalty of sin is death. The penalty of sin is death. It's a grave matter. It's life and death. It matters profoundly. But every time you sin, you don't have to die. You can have a substitute death through this idea of sacrifice. And God was speaking in this way that he was setting up so that when Jesus comes, we, they all understood what substitute death was all about. Uh, one of the cool little tricks you could do uh, with atonement is if you spread that word out, you could say at one mint. The atonement of sins is the at one mint of us and God. Sin is forgiven. Sin is eradicated and we are made at one. We are in relationship with God. Now here's what they believed about sacrifice is that the purer the animal, the more potent the blood, the more powerful the sacrifice that's why you would always read in the Old Testament is find a sacrifice without blemish, right? Find an animal that's, you know, as perfect as can be, but either by its outer coats or, or its health, right? Because they believe that provided a more powerful sacrifice. It was so powerful, in fact, living, you know, sacrifices like this, animal sacrifices, if they were pure enough, were considered to protect you against death, even like think about the Passover in Exodus 12. Okay, you with me so far? I know. This is a more technical sermon, as I said. So here's the mechanics, roughly, of how it would work. Right? This is really simplified. But the idea is I would go to the temple to seek forgiveness of, for my sins, and I would bring the purest, healthiest animal possible because I want it to be an effective sacrifice for me. I would bring to the altar, I would perform, I would perform the sacrifice and the priest would take the blood and sprinkle it on the altar. Now I know, to us, this is, this is the deer hanging in the garage. This is not what we're accustomed to. This feels barbaric. But just understand, it, the culture, this was something deeply spiritual. It was about relationship with God. So this idea of substitute death. Because the sin in me had to die if I wanted to live in a relationship with God... I needed a way to kill my sin, erase it, so that I can live. And then, of course, Jesus comes. Jesus enters the timeline as one of us, and he becomes the ultimate substitute. Because here's the thing. Animal sacrifice is just treating the symptoms, not the disease. The disease of sin that keeps us separated from God. Those sacrifices could forgive the, that sin kind of one at a time, but it's not really treating the problem itself. In fact, the whole Old Testament is a bit of a setup to show that we can't follow God's law perfectly on our own. We need this sacrifice idea so that we can be made right with God. And it's in Jesus Christ he becomes the ultimate substitute where you no longer need animal sacrifices. This one's good forever. Sin is fully and finally forgiven. Why? Remember the idea of the pure blood? The pure the sacrifice, the more potent the blood. Imagine how powerful the blood of a perfect God would be 
as a sacrifice. Powerful enough to cover everyone forever. And so God's saying, and it's, it's interesting too to me, as culture progressed, then animal sacrifices were no longer needed. And culture wasn't really doing that anymore. He says, that time is over because I've now made the most powerful sacrifice ever. And that's why John the Baptist, John 1, 129, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God, the substitute sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The blood of goats is from Hebrews. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death? And here we arrive at probably the greatest promise of all time. And it's not number two on our list because of priority. It's just the second one I want to talk about. Incredible promise number two. Jesus takes the blame of sin for us and offers us unfathomable grace. You cannot measure the depth of God's grace. Sin is much worse than you thought. And grace is much better than you imagined. I believe that when you're going through the wilderness, there's no greater promise to cling to. No matter what happens to me in my life, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what tomorrow's going to bring, here's what I do know. God himself, Jesus, the word made flesh, was a sacrifice for me, bringing me life instead of death. Whatever's going to happen to me next, whatever unknown, whatever hard thing I'm about to go through, I could cling to that. I know that he loved me before I even knew to say his name. He loved me before I even knew I had a sin problem. He cured the disease before I knew I was diagnosed, right? No greater promise to cling to. Now, that's only part of it. So I would say this is, this is like the river in the wilderness. Understanding this is understanding that the river is always there. No matter what I'm going through, the river of life, made possible by the sacrifice, the ultimate substitution sacrifice of God, is there and available for me. But oddly maybe ironically, it's also sacrifice that needs to happen for the next part. And that is, the river does no good unless I drink from it, unless I follow it. I can know the river's there. It's not going to help me survive if I don't utilize it. And that requires our sacrifice. Sacrifice is such a big part of our faith. To understand the grace and mercy and love of God, we understand the sacrifice he made. But then to understand how do we respond to the grace and mercy and love of God? By sacrificing what we want for what God wants. God doesn't want dead sacrifices anymore. He only wants one kind, living sacrifices, right? No more dead sacrifices. We are called to be living sacrifices. Thy will be done. That old Lord's Prayer that you've probably prayed many times in your life. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do we really mean that when we pray that? Your will be done. Actually, my will, so long as like it's cool with you, just come do my will, and then your will, I hope, kind of gets done. This is how Paul says it in Romans 12. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of what Jesus did for you and laying down his life for you, in view of that sacrifice, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Well, what does that look like? Living sacrifices. 
He continues. This is in verse 9. Verses 9 through 18 or 9 through 20, I'll encourage you. You may want to go home, print them out, and stick them somewhere that you see these. This is how you drink from the river. This is how you follow the stream in the wasteland. In view of God's mercy, you become a living sacrifice, which looks like this. Verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is how you become a living sacrifice. I heard, I think it was John Ortberg who said this. If it wasn't him, I'm giving credit to whomever said it, and I remembered it. Is that if you want to boil this down and make it real simple, in order to be a living sacrifice, do the next right thing you know to do. Do the next right, don't overcomplicate it. Just today, do the next right thing you know to do. And then after that, do the next one. And over time, well, you start drinking from the water drinking from the river of life. To be honest with you, submitting to become more like Jesus is the real gruesome business of sacrifice. I don't know about you, but this living sacrifice likes to get up off the altar from time to time. But I feel like we get this in our heads that a sacrifice is so like, I got to do for Jesus. You know, the Eeyore Christian? I got to do for Jesus. It's a beautiful day, I, I suppose. <laughs> no, it's, you know what it's like? It's like my son when he came home last night from their football scrimmage, eighth grade football scrimmage. And we get home, it was a long, they played six quarters. It was like ridiculous. They were, they were letting everybody play. They had, it was a long night. And, and the kids were all pretty fried. He comes home. He gets out of the shower. He's like, Mom, Dad, I didn't even realize. And he's like, bruise, bruise, cut, cut, bruise, cut on his leg. He's like, I, I didn't even feel it. I didn't even know it was all there until right now. <laughs> well, you okay? Yeah. But it, he's telling us that, and he, his ear-to-ear -ear grin Sacrificing for the sake of something you love is joyful. You don't even pay attention to the scars. They become badges of honor. You're so grateful that you get to serve to be a part of something bigger than you. To do your best. To take your hits and keep going. This is the life of faith. This is what sacrificing for God is. It's a joyful act of thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's a joyful act of saying, I'm, I'm not just going to live my life for me. I'm going to live it for God's purpose in the world. I'm blessed so that I can be a blessing. This is how you drink from the stream and the wasteland. This is the life that sustains you no matter what hits you take. We learned something really important about sacrifice here. Really important. And that is sacrifice is really all about relationships, isn't it? The very first sacrifice ever made, animal sacrifice anyway, was all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had eaten from the fruit. They sinned. They became ashamed. What did God do? Provided. He sacrificed the animals and gave them clothing to cover their sin. 
to keep them warm, to provide for them, even though they said goodbye to perfection. He never said goodbye to them. So the question is, how can your life be a living sacrifice or offering to God? Maybe I ask that question and you immediately start thinking about some things. Or maybe you don't, but maybe it's just do the next right thing you know to do. So I'll tell you this much. No matter what you're going through, there's somebody that's watching to see how you navigate it. And when you go through it with the joy of the Lord, drinking deeply from the stream in the wasteland, that may be what brings them to faith. And most of the time, you don't even know it. Hang on to this promise. This promise will keep you going. Amen.